part of the Earglue Media family of podcasts. You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We're your hosts, Maggie and Nicole. So we have mentioned many times on this podcast that we are both huge Down the Abbey fans. So no one should be terribly surprised by the fact that we have decided to talk about the new and perhaps final installment of the Down the Abbey franchise, Down the Abbey, A New Era. I am so excited to get to talk about this movie with you. Uh, Downton Abbey, A New Era is now available on Peacock, or it is on other platforms that you can rent or buy. It is the sequel to both, obviously, the Downton Abbey television series and the previous Downton Abbey film, which I believe was just titled Downton Abbey. Um, And it came out in May of this year, so just a couple of months ago. It was written by Julian Fellows, of course, and directed by Simon Curtis, who is new to the series, but not necessarily um, completely new to it in that he is married to Elizabeth McGovern, has been for a long time. Uh, and, you know, so he's he's been sort of on the Downton Abbey journey, just not as an actual creator until this point. The whole cast basically returns. It's an enormous ensemble cast. And there's also some new faces, most notably Hugh Dancy, Laura Haddock, and Dominic West. It received actually very positive reviews and earned $90.2 million at the box office. So more than made back uh, its budget, which is awesome to see. And essentially the film has two plot lines. One is that uh, Maggie Smith's character, the, the Dowager Countess, has found out that in the will of an old flame of hers, he's left her this villa in France. And so Robert and Cora and some of the crew go over to see the villa and to try and figure out exactly why this man left her this house. Meanwhile, back at Downton Abbey, Mary is sort of overseeing Downton becoming a film set. And uh, some Americans have come in to make a film at Downton Abbey. Of course, it's a very like, Uh, meta thing because it's being filmed at high clear it's sort of all about how that is part of the change from silent films to talkies and we sort of see that happen over the course of them making their movie and that's what we're going to talk about today in part um sort of about the transition from silent films to talkies but first maggie i want to know what you thought of the movie Oh my God. I love this movie so much. (laughs) I cry like a baby. And um, one of my coworkers got to see the after effects of that too. Cause I I live not far from one of my coworkers and we were both at the same screening and I was just like a mess, but like he was also crying. So it's, it's a tear jerker of a movie. I was, I was crying and I was in a showing a special press screening that they organized. Thank you. Focus features just for me in North Carolina. (laughs) So it's literally me and the film security dude sitting a few rows behind me. So I was so aware of the fact that like the four different times I cried in this movie that like, there was no mistaking it. This dude knew it was me. (laughs) Yeah, I was incredible. like, I'm sorry. I literally at the end, I like walked out. I did not even look at him. I was like, I can't face you right now. <laughs> Gosh. Oh. Like yelled thank you as I walked. <laughs> You're like, nope, nope, nope. No, it's literally like nobody needs to see what I look like. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Um, I really, there are so many things I loved about this movie. I really loved uh, the way that Mary's story paralleled uh, Violet's story that we were learning about um, from Violet's past. I mean, we clearly see that Jack uh, had a thing for her. (laughs) And I don't think that that's a kind of like fling on his part that will end very similar to how it was for Violet's just because I just I felt like the way they left that story was like, he's definitely going to come calling again. Um, And I mean, who can blame him? Uh, (laughs) And I I loved I, you know, it it just it felt like such a good evolution for Mary's character. Um, And when I talk about costumes, I'll talk a little bit more about Mary's character and how they um, positioned her in this film. Um, And I really thought that worked really well for a natural evolution for her character. Uh, I am incredibly sad that we didn't get um, a lot of Thomas. I know, obviously, like you said, huge ensemble cast. They had a lot of loose ends to tie up. 
Um, a lot of the downstairs staff had to have their happily ever afters, uh, which I was perfectly fine with, but I just, I wanted more of Thomas. He is my favorite, uh, but he's happy. And that's all that I could ask for. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you know that I've had a bit going uh, since the first Downton Abbey film of Kirby with a knife. Um <laughs> <laughs> threatening uh in a general fashion uh if anything should bad like bad should happen to thomas because let's be real the down Abbey series uh put him through the ringer uh and thus yep. i was also put through the ringer yep. uh so like if <laughs> if guy dexter <laughs> so much as hurt <laughs> his feelings one time i will go taken on this man um because yep. i just like i I love Thomas so much, but like jokes aside, I was really happy with this exit strategy for Thomas. Um, it's honestly the best that we could have gotten for this era. Uh, so many of his past attempts have failed naturally because of English sensibilities, the situation that he's in. Um, but with guy, he has this opportunity while you know being queer is obviously still very much frowned upon at this period of time at least the hollywood types were more willing to turn a blind eye because it was um a large part of you know the male actors at the time there were a lot of you know closeted uh queer men so people were more willing to turn a blind eye and i think that the situation they created for thomas is really the only way that he was going to get to live uh, as open as possible and to have that companionship and also freedom to go places and see things. And I was really satisfied with that, you know, outcome for him. And I loved, you know, Mary's acceptance of it too. And just like how everything worked out. I just, I felt like Thomas got the best, the best ending for his character and as much as i would love to see him again and while i don't think we're probably going to see any more down abbey films i also kind of just don't because i want his story to stop there where it's happy and on a high note and before uh, things get any worse uh because things will get worse here uh shortly so you know i'm I'm happy with it and honestly like why is rob james collier not in everything why uh, is he not like a superstar like this man is so talented he is of like probably the the in the top three of talented like new faces and look i'm gonna say it the man is so talented and so hot he's it so hot <laughs> i'm like, like trying to like dance around this i'm like he's he's so talented he's so he's talented so hot. his face like, is so, he is unbelievably hot um like congrats and, to his parents like yes your yes. genes mixed well <laughs> and i constantly <laughs> constantly look to see if he has new projects and this man just like does not work much and i don't know if that's maybe he doesn't want to work much and if that's yeah. his prerogative if so, so be it. then like that's good go but dude. uh yeah. if you do want to work more please get another agent um because you would definitely be able to be in a lot of things that are filming currently like i keep seeing yeah. shows and i'm like wow why is he not in this why is he not cast in this role like I will be your agent. I will get you there. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, like honestly, like I felt like Down Abbey gave birth to so many incredible rising stars, but they have not risen as far as they should have. Like, um, other than like Lily James, yeah, like, like Lily James, and Lily James already <laughs> had some weight behind her when she came into yeah. Downton. And she already had done some things. Like mm -hmm. Michelle Dockery has done some stuff. Like she did that. Um, defending jacob series yep. defending jacob series yeah. and she's done like a smattering of things but she's also an incredibly talented actress and like she's just only in the down abbey stuff so like there's a part of me that's like maybe this is a good place to stop everyone's mostly happy um i'm not happy that matthew good wasn't in this but everybody's mostly happy and like maybe this will give them a chance to not like be waiting for that call from julian fellows like what's what's next like what because like let's be real american audiences love the brits and they love the brits when they come over here and do an american accent so like all of you have the i mean look at dan stevens like we all we still take the mick out of him for his abrupt departure as matthew which you know i love the fact that this film talked about matthew as much as it yes, did same. and like the small ways that made me happy but like and simple <laughs> like in hindsight, I do think that Dan leaving was the best thing that he could have done for his career. Like, even though he plateaued there for a little bit, like he got Legion, yeah. he's done some other big projects. He, he just got nominated for the Hollywood Critics' yeah. Choice Awards. I also think for... he finally figured out that, like, he is a character actor in a leading yes. man's body and has figured out how to use that. Like, yes, 
yeah. like kudos to him kudos to his agent if it was his agent like somebody finally figured out like oh we know exactly what kind of role that you are yep. suited for and i i hope that if this is indeed which i think it is the final down abbey mm-hmm. uh that everybody will now you know, let go of the training wheels and <laughs> go grab some really awesome projects because I want to watch you in them. Yeah. I love this movie. And I think it feels so much more like the actual series than the first film did. The first mm-hmm. film was so fluffy and it felt more like a Christmas special or something than like an actual proper Downton Abbey story. And I feel like this has more of the emotional weight to it that the actual series always did, um, which I really appreciated. And I mean, I cried like a baby in this film. Um, And uh, things that surprised me, because I think there was a plot line that we all saw coming, particularly when it didn't happen in the first movie. But then there's a plot line in this that took me so by surprise and I was not ready for that involved Cora and Robert that truly had me just an emotional wreck. Um, But I, you know, I think that I love the meta aspect of, you know, a film being made at Downton as Downton is being filmed at High Clear Castle. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about High Clear in a bit. Uh, But also... I really do think that this was was done really cleverly and that they made a film that could be a really strong end to Downton Abbey. This could be a very fitting total finale to the whole series. On the other hand, they did leave it open enough that if they wanted to come back and do another film, particularly even if they wanted to come back and do another film with only part of the cast, they easily could. Um, you know, if, you know some of the cast, Alan Leach, um, uh, I'm losing words, Laura Carmichael, Harry Hatton Patton, even, even Hugh Bonneville and Elizabeth McGovern wanted to do a film and nobody else did, they could easily do that, set it in France again. If those people weren't interested, but Michelle Dockery was down and Hugh Dancy wanted to come back, they could do another movie is made at Downton Abbey film and maybe sort of pursue that romantic connection. I think that like they left it in a really good place or that if that is something down the road that the team is interested in doing, they can, but it doesn't feel like it wasn't wrapped up. And plus we have the kids. Exactly. And the kids are included in this just enough that I was like, Oh, they're trying to remind us that there is this future generation and it would be neat to see Mary fill more of that like dowager countess role with kids and i think it would be interesting because which i'll talk a little bit more about this later whenever i get into the history of high clear but just as downton is a hospital during world war one so was high clear castle during world war ii high clear castle actually was a home for evacuees from london um particularly children and i think that could be a really interesting plot line if they wanted to sort of do a time jump maybe wait a while to make another movie time jump forward a bit um you know have some of the the like michelle dockery and some of those characters come back but also have the children you know as more of the main characters i think that could be something really interesting uh so i i really do like that they sort of left it where they can go back if they want to I I really do think that the performances in this are super strong. Of course, Maggie Smith is excellent, but I think this is probably Hugh Bonneville's best work in this role. Hugh was the one who made me cry the hardest. I, my God, he made me sob. Like the garden scene. I just, the, the garden way scene. I, the way that I don't feel like enough people have talked about the garden scene, it has like yeah. devastated me because this is such a yep. prim and proper man. And this is the man that's like, he's taken everything with a stiff upper lip. His mother's dying. He might not be his father's son. And then it's, it's Cora that just yep. absolutely blows him down. And he just, yep. like, and, and like, I'm that kind of person, like I'm the kind of person's like, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And then like the final straw and you just like, you just lose it. And it was so, I lost it in the audience. <laughs> I, also think it's so impressive because like I am well on record as being a Robert hater. I hate Lord Grantham. I've never <laughs> forgiven him for things that he did in the earlier seasons. The way that he treated Sybilis and, and Edith too is something that will never sit right with me. Um, and yet this man reduced me to tears, um, which I think is very impressive. Like they made me actually care about Robert for the first time in the whole series, which is incredible. Uh 
But, you know, much like Maggie's whole shtick is if Thomas Barrow is happy, then so is she. Um, if Tom Branson is happy, then so am I. <laughs> I love that we Maggie, love the Toms. <laughs> we literally, we both were like, um, we're going to claim a Thomas. That's going to be our thing. And I love Tom Branson so much. He also has been very much put through the ringer over the course of the series um, and has had quite the transformation. And my other favorite character, weirdly enough, out of the ones still living, is Edith. And she's someone who also has had like a really incredible transformation over the course of the whole thing. I used to hate her. (laughs) Same. I used to as well. But now sort of seeing what she's come into and getting to see her plotline around this about the idea that, you know, she is learning how to be a working mother and Mm -hmm. she's learning that like she does want to get back to the journalism and, and to that side of herself and to fulfill herself creatively. I thought was really fun to see and to see her and her husband, who I, I adore, Harry Haddon Patton, who, like to see who them. supports her so much. Oh my God, to see him supporting her, I was like crying. Mary um, wishes she had that. <laughs> okay, truly, also, I think maybe it's just that all I want in life is to be like Edith, a journalist and mother with a super supportive rich husband. Like she's living my dreams. <laughs> if any, if any, like, what is he a Marquess? If any Marquesses are listening, uh, hit me up. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I know I just like think... all the Marquesses listen to this podcast. They Obviously. love us. Obviously. But yeah, I just, I thought it was really great. And it was really fun for me too, because I reviewed the film for Next Best Picture. And then I got to do some interviews uh, with Julian Fellows and then with, Laura Carmichael and Alan Leach, which was super special to get to chat to them about this movie and and to get to chat to them sort of about where their characters have gone and, and to Julian Fellows about sort of, you know, what it's meant to dive back into this world. And it was so special to to get to talk to them about it. And, you know, especially if this is truly the end of Downton Abbey, which I don't know, there, there's a part of me that doesn't believe it. Um, and I, Julian Fellows was a little bit wishy-washy on whether or not he has any intentions of of doing another thing after this. So I think maybe everyone is sort of just waiting to see. But I do think that this movie definitely proves that there's still an audience for this, mm-hmm. uh, without a doubt. But speaking of audiences, <laughs> um, I want to talk about the birth of talkies and when audiences suddenly decided they no longer cared about silent films, which is what we see in the film um, that they are making a silent movie at Downton Abbey. And then basically they get the uh, heads up from the studio that silent films are no longer popular because of the birth of talkies and how people have taken to them. And they are not going to fund a movie like this that doesn't have sound. And so they have to pivot and make it a sound film. And the sort of birth of talkies and the switch over to it is actually really fascinating because it happened within like a four year period that synchronized sound just completely changed the film industry forever. Um, And it changed everything from like the equipment that was used to how films were shot to how background actors were used. and You know, it was a death knoll for some actors whose voices um, or whose acting styles weren't suited to the new format. That was an issue that a lot of actors did have. Um, There were actors simply who, like, people didn't feel like their voices fit how they looked or the type of characters that they played. And that truly did end careers. So it's a really interesting transition. I think it's one of the, like, quickest large-scale transformations we've ever seen take place in media. But there have been movies with sound before. Um, Alice Guy Blaché, I think is how it said, um, in like ni- in 1898 was making film with sound, but like no theaters had the expensive sound equipment to play them. So it wasn't until actually 1926 that they were able to like make films with sound that a lot of people could see. But basically, Warner Brothers was an early investor in Vitaphone's sound on disc system. And the Vitaphone system was developed by Western Electric and Bell Telephone, a company you might have heard of before. Uh, And 
it was originally meant to just provide musical accompaniment to silent films because the way that silent films work for anyone who doesn't know is you would have the film that you would show and then you would typically have a pianist or an orchestra playing music to accompany it. And they decided, well, what if we could send the music with the film and they wouldn't need to, um, you know, do it live. But then in, in 1926, Warner Brothers releases Don Juan, which is the first full length movie with synchronized score and sound effects. They had like sword clashing sound effects in the sword fights. It didn't have any dialogue in it, but it did have musical shorts and a recorded speech by Will Hayes that went with it. Um, and so the following year, Warner Brothers releases a Jazz Singer starring Al Jolson, which is the first feature with actual recorded dialogue. It actually only has dialogue in two scenes, but it was enough that people sort of went crazy for this phenomenon. And the following year, Lights of New York was the first feature film with full dialogue recorded all the way through. And by 1930, no silent films are being made anymore, which is kind of incredible to think that, you know, to go from in 1928, having the first full sound film to two years later, you're no longer making silent films. I know I keep like harping on this, but I just think that's an incredible sense of change. Like, I don't know that we've experienced something like that because if you think about like, oh, things that have changed, you know, the film industry, like 3D or um, even shooting on digital or uh, sort of the transition from like VHS to DVD, DVD to Blu-ray, none of those things like transformed as quickly or as effectively as this did. Um, but in any case, uh, a lot of these early films haven't survived or if they did survive, they're in really poor condition, especially the sound portion of them. And some people think that that's why, like if you watch some of these early sound films, they have like a really tinny sound to them. And that actually is just distortion that's happened over time. That's not necessarily what they sounded like in the day. But it changed how films were produced and distributed. It killed off having live orchestras. And it meant the theaters had to install sound equipment. By 1930, 10,000 of the 15,000 theaters nationwide had been outfitted for sound. And they had to figure out a way to make the equipment on set uh, make less sound and had to adapt to having these multi-camera shots because they couldn't move the cameras around as much without making noise that would get caught on the microphones. Because of course, at this time, microphones were very sensitive. And some of the earliest sound movies, you can see that they're like experimenting with where to put microphones before they decide that, you know, the best place to put them is overhead. And there's a couple of films where you can see them in like flower pots, apparently, that they would have placed around the set to try to, to give places that people could pick up on the sound. Um, two film genres really take off uh, with sound films. One of them is musicals and the other one is gangster films, which were already popular as silent movies. But obviously you think of gangster films, you think of those accents and those became really popular sound movies. A lot of Broadway shows were adapted to the screen and new musicals were written. The backstage musical became very popular, which is essentially any sort of musical about putting on a musical. So think of something like 42nd Street. There's a lot of films from the 1930s that are essentially that. Uh, I also thought it was very interesting. In 1929, a lot of the studios were basically doing this thing where they recorded all of their big contracted stars doing like song, dance, comedy skits to see who translated well to film with sound. So MGM's Hollywood Review of 1929 had John Gilbert, Norma Shearer, Buster Keaton, Joan Crawford, William Hayes. Um, Warner Brothers did something similar with all of its contracted people to sort of do a test run on like who was going to make the transition. And there were a lot of, you know, actors who were able to make that transition, obviously, like um, Joan Crawford, did it totally fine. And then there were others who never really were able to recapture the popularity that they'd had during the silent film days. But uh, the last thing I wanted to note is that America's early adaptation of um, early adoption of sound film is part of what shoots Hollywood ahead of European film production, because they're really the ones who sort of um, hit on it right away and go with it. And that is part of how Hollywood becomes Hollywood, Hollywood's heyday really is in those 1930s and 40s when it 
sort of takes off. And then, of course, the war happening in Europe in the 40s also means that it sort of is set behind the U.S. and it never really comes back. That was a lot of information that I don't know if I necessarily <laughs> knew everything about. Yeah, so, I found out things like, while researching this that I like don't think I knew beforehand. Yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, I would love to see somebody do like a movie dedicated to this period of time. Same, same. And I, I do think it's really interesting sort of some of the things that I hadn't thought about because obviously like the things that we see in this or that we see in the movie Singing in the Rain where an actress has a voice that isn't well suited to it or something like that, that's obvious. But things like, oh, they had to move the cameras in a different way because you could now hear the camera being moved is something that I'd not thought yeah. about before. And that being like why we start to get a lot of multi-camera shots uh, movies um, is not a thing that I'd ever heard. No, that was the thing that was like, that was news to me, yeah, but it makes right? sense also. Like that's yeah. the thing that was like, oh yeah, that obviously. That also would. background actors had to start miming um, <laughs> like movement and speaking instead of actually beforehand. Peas they could and just carrots. Talk. Peas and carrots. Well, beforehand they could just like openly talk. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously then if you stick a microphone in there, you don't want to be picking up all their conversations. And because the mics of the day weren't like, you know, advanced enough to be able to pick up certain close up sound and not farther away. Like it, it's really interesting to think about how different it would have been. It probably actually would not have been as easy to transition as they show it as in Down Abbey, a new era. <laughs> Yes, that was definitely a work of fiction. Yes. Uh, but speaking of leading ladies and people in this period of transition, um, I, when I was watching this, was convinced that Myrna Dalgleish uh, is loosely based on the silent film actress uh, Myrna Loy, who rose to fame during this very transitional period in silent films and talkies. Uh, but we are actually going to talk about Norma Talmadge, I think is how her name was said, who was actually the inspiration for Laura Haddock's performance. Uh, naturally, there were a lot of actresses whose careers didn't quite survive this transition. Uh, so I'm sure there are plenty of other actresses that when they were writing this, that they were probably inspired by. Uh, but this was just the one that I found Laura mentioned as her own personal inspiration. Uh, so Norma was born on May 2nd in 1894 in Jersey City, New Jersey, though she claimed that she was born in Niagara Falls, New York. Uh, she later admitted that she and her mother provided this more scenic setting for her birth uh, to fan magazines so that it sounded more romantic, uh, which as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, that makes sense. Because like Myrna's whole story is like she's from somewhere that she's not quite actually from. Uh, so I, I definitely liked that. Um, and I thought that was that made sense. Um, Norma had a very tragic youth. Um, she had an alcoholic father who walked out on the family, leaving her mother to find ways to pull herself and her three daughters out of poverty. Her mother did a lot of work. She sold stuff. She like did odd jobs. She made stuff. She like, she tried everything that she could to make sure that she and her daughters would survive. Um, and then she got the bright idea of encouraging her daughters to try out show business. Uh, they saw like an actress performing at a local theater. She was also doing film. It just seemed like, okay, maybe this is something that we can do. All three of the girls were beautiful. It made sense. Um, so her younger sisters were named Natalie and Constance. They also went on to become actresses. Um, and her first appearance was in 1909 in the household pest uh, she kind of booked this role after doing some like photography for someone she sat as a model and then they're like oh we have this project you're beautiful let's put you in this and the role was really small she appeared as a young girl who was kissed under a photographer's cloth i thought it was kind of ironic the, the situation <laughs> that this role came from and then how she was booked it. She was not credited for it either. Uh, so it doesn't even show up on her IMDb, you know, cause I'm sure she was really worried about that. <laughs> uh, but she was like, uh, gotta get that IMDb credit. <laughs> gotta get that credit. Uh, <laughs> historical actors. They're just like us. They'll do anything for a credit. Uh, but her first official role came in 1911 in the child Caruso's. Um, 
though it, along with most of her first five years of films, are either lost or never completed. Uh, like Nicole was saying, like there's just a lot of issues when it comes to silent films and their preservation. Um, there are a few that the Library of Congress has like components of, but not full films of. Um, if you really want to go track down information about Norma's um, career. Uh, so in the mid-20s, she signed with the United Artists, which still exists today. Uh, if you saw Respect or James Bond, like that's part of the United uh, Artists um, studio. Uh, but so her first films for the studio were The Dove and The Woman Dispute It. Uh, both of these films were box office disasters. Um, this was that period of time where things were starting to shift towards talkies. People didn't really care about silent films. So even though she had had like some really successful films, she had a whole handful of films before this that did really well. And that's why she ended up getting signed with United Artists because she was like an up and coming silent film actress. Uh, but this just, people weren't interested in seeing silent films now that they had this alternative form of entertainment. And like, if you think about how, how film was an entertainment for them at the time, the novelty of talkies um, definitely would have drawn the audiences just like we see in Down Abbey. Uh, and it was very bleak uh, for her and a lot of actors at this time. Um, Norma's career kind of went on a steady decline then uh, into the late twenties. Uh, and in 1928, uh, there is an attempt um, by United Artists to show that the American film director D.W. Griffith could still produce films that drew audiences. So they brought together a slate of all of their actors, which included Norma, Charlie Chaplin, John Barrymore, and a whole bunch of other really recognizable names. They put them on this radio show called um, the Dodge Brothers Hour for them to like talk about this like transitional period in film and like how bright and you know how much potential there was. It unfortunately did not help any of their cases. And as we know, because we were talking about a talky film uh, in the year of 2022, obviously silent films, no longer a thing. Uh, her last film was Dewberry Woman of Passion, uh, which was released in 1930. She later retired after that. Uh, and she died in 1957 at the age of 63. Uh, she is buried in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery and Talmadge Street in Los Feliz neighborhood of Los Angeles is named in her honor. That's awesome. Yeah. As I started um, to research her, I was like, oh yeah, this is definitely who they, they be definitely here on. Yeah. And I think they did like a, a good job of sort of making the character original enough that she fit into what they were doing, but it definitely feels like they were uh, very aware of, of you know, where they were taking this yes. from. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to discuss today was High Clear Castle as a film location, because it felt like a little fun tidbit to share, particularly because I did find out um, back when the film came out, I was looking at it and I found out a very fun fact that I'll share in a minute. But High Clear Castle, first of all, just to give some background on the actual house itself, was built in 1679 and renovated in the 1840s. Uh, the, the park was also designed in the 18th century. The current castle or manor home that we see today was designed by Sir Charles Barry, who also worked in the Houses of Parliament. It is part of a 5,000 acre estate in Hampshire, England, and it is the country seat of the Earls of Carnivron, uh, which you may know of because the fifth Earl was the one to finance archaeologist Howard Carter in 1922 when he found King Tut's tomb. So that's why they still have an Egyptian collection at the house today whenever you go and tour it. But it is still currently lived in. Um, it was used during World War I as a hospital, just like Downton Abbey was. And evacuated children during World War II uh, were brought there to live during the Blitz. The house is open to tour during certain times of the year, though it does also remain a private residence and obviously a film location. Uh, and I highly recommend following the Instagram account for it. It's run by the uh, Earl and his wife. And Lady um, Carnivron also has a blog and a new podcast about life in the castle and researching the people who lived there and who visited. There was a film actress who was briefly married to um, one of the Earls at one point and lived there for a 
very brief while before their divorce that she, I think, recently did a post on, which was really interesting. Uh, but definitely check out her stuff. But I want to talk about films made there as well, because I think it's a really interesting and fun set of films and TV. And the fun fact that I found out is that the first film to be made at Highclere Castle was The Missionary in 1982, which has Maggie Smith in it. Um, and I think it's so fun that, like, obviously, Downton Abbey is the thing that Highclere Castle is best known for now. And the fact that it got its start in the movies with Maggie Smith, I think, is honestly so special. Uh, but there was also a 1987 TV movie, The Secret Garden, there. Um, in 1988, A Handful of Dust with Kristen Scott Thomas filmed there. Um, it, the thing that it was best known for before Downton Abbey was that Jeeves and... Um, Worcester, is that how it's pronounced? Worcester? Uh, I could never pronounce that right. Filmed there from 1990 to 1993 with Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. I also thought it was interesting in 1990, the TV movie Spy Maker, The Secret Life of Ian Fleming, filmed there, uh, which also has Kristen Scott Thomas in it, returning just a couple of years later. Uh, in 1991, King Ralph with John Goodman and Peter O'Toole filmed there. And in 1991, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner, Morgan Freeman, Christian Slater, Alan Rickman, that whole incredible cast did some filming there as well. Uh, in 1991, the TV movie Duel of Hearts. And in 1992, the TV movie A Sense of History uh, filmed there. That one's interesting because it was written by and starred Jim Broadbent. And I did not know that he had ever like been involved in anything other than acting. So that was fun and sent me down a tangent. Uh, probably the best known movie to ever be filmed there is 1999's Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, which did some work there. Uh, and then in 2000, there was a film called Back to the Secret Garden made there, a follow-up to the earlier Secret Garden film, which I'm now dreadfully curious about. Uh, I thought that this one would particularly be interesting to Maggie in 2002, The Four Feathers with Heath Ledger and Kate Hudson was filmed there. Yes. Have you seen that one? I have. Yes. Okay, I figured you had. <laughs> uh, in 2004, an episode of Marple was filmed there, and that was one of the last things before Downton Abbey began filming at the castle. They do use both exteriors and interiors of the castle, um, although they they you know do also do some work with sets at a studio. But uh, truly, like if you look at pictures of the actual house, it's clear just how much of it they are using from the inside. And with the popularity of Downton Abbey, it has become one of the most visited country homes in the whole UK. Uh, in 2010, they did film a TV movie called Made in Britain there, sort of, I think, either just before or just after the first season of Downton Abbey. But since then, it has basically been exclusively the Downton Abbey filming location, obviously, for the series and both films as well. Um, otherwise, though, there have been several Antiques Roadshow episodes done there, and then a handful of documentary episodes about the castle itself. Uh, but I think it's really interesting to think of if Downton Abbey is sort of done filming there. Will it go back to being a location for other films? Has it become sort of too iconic as Downton Abbey to serve as a film location for other things now? It's very rare for a house like this to be a set for something so long and so iconic. So I do think it's going to be very interesting to see if other places start or, or other films start to use it again, or if it sort of needs a period of rest so that people won't just be watching something and be like, they're at Downton Abbey. <laughs> like Leonardo DiCaprio pointing me. Yes. It will be interesting to see what happens. Mm -hmm. But it I is think such an iconic. Absolutely. And, and I think it's really interesting to sort of think about all of the things that we see in the film going on with Downton Abbey happening at Highclere Castle. But at the same time, to think about the way in which, you know, they, they've said that Highclere Castle really was sort of in ruin whenever they uh, began using it as a film location. Their roof was in a terrible state, like worse than we see Downton's in. And it really was the film and TV industry that was able to save the house and make it still livable and visitable today. So um, it's something that I don't think we think about that often whenever we talk about filming on location. But a lot of times for these historic houses, being used as a film location can be the difference between being able to upkeep the house or have to let it sort of fall into disrepair. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. So shout out, you know, for, I feel like for our podcast, it's very fitting to shout yes. out the fact that sometimes the film industry actually can play a hand in 
preserving history. Yeah. I mean, that's what's keeping most of the British houses um, yeah. functioning. And that and weddings. <laughs> yeah. So, as long as yeah. people keep getting married and making movies, we're doing good. We'll keep them for yep. a little while longer. Uh, <laughs> there's really no easy way to segue ever to costuming. <laughs> uh, but it is now the yeah. time. <laughs> from from sort of part of production design to costume. Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah. You know, we talk about dressing up the house. Now we're talking about dressing the people. There you go. There's the segue. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Down Abbey, A New Era's costumes were designed by Anne Robbins, uh, who did the costumes for the first movie, as well as 18 episodes of the series. Uh, she's also known for her work on The Last Letter from Your Lover, uh, which I was like, oh, I didn't realize she did the costumes for that. Um, with The New Era... I know. I was like, huh. I really liked that movie. (laughs) I did too. Uh, So with the new era taking place a year after the first film, the costumes have emerged from the 1920s and are starting to fully shift into the 1930s. And you see that reflected in almost every single person uh, in this cast, in this movie. I really loved that a lot of Mary's looks were no longer chic and fashion forward. They felt very much like she was starting to veer towards this more lady of the house, dowager-ish appearance, uh, which seems very much to mirror this ascent into taking Violet's place. Uh, And I really loved how that worked visually. Uh, You know, she's no longer swanning about like she once did. She's very much settled, very much secure in her position in the house. Um, And even some of her jewelry seemed more stately and more like Violet. And then I found out that they are actually meant to look like Violet's jewelry. So that was like an intentional choice that the costumes made. Uh, And I love that because it is very, very clear. Uh, With the 1930s, um, a new era finally gets to explore some of this classic sportswear looks that started to become very popular during this era, uh, including the tennis attire and the swimsuits. Uh, this is also the first time that we've seen somebody from Downton Abbey wearing a swimsuit. So I thought that was neat. I was like, wait, oh yeah. When no, we, we when we saw Tom Bredzing in that swimsuit, I audibly gasped. And then I all thought I of you. was that the man, the security man heard me do that. <laughs> I thought of you. So please know. I thought he looked was. dashing. <laughs> he did. He did. He I mean, he was, and he was so happy in that scene. So I was like, I haven't, I haven't felt this way since Sybil was alive. <laughs> Truly. Oh, my heart. Um, but it was so fun that we got to see a little bit more of this recreational style. Um, and it, it is really um, indicative of how things are very much shifting, even for the upper class. Um, uh, that kind of like letting your guard down in that way um, just is really just evident of the shift into the 1930s. And really a testament to just like how far we've come through history with this group of people like just i don't know it was just neat to like realize like how many eras of fashion and how much history has passed uh since the show first premiered um my coworker at Collider, whose name is also Maggie, uh, got to fly out to England for the very special um, release party for it going over to Peacock. Uh, and as part of her trip, she actually got to talk to um, the costume designer about the costumes. Uh, and you can watch that over on Collider's interview website on YouTube. Uh, but uh, I was most excited about this interview. Like She interviewed some of the cast and I was like, no, no, no. I want to know what the costumer had to say. Uh, so she did have this one really interesting quote um, where they were talking about um, using modern textiles and how to handle historical accuracy versus historical authenticity. Uh, because you can be as historically accurate as possible, but you're never going to be able to replicate something authentically because we just don't have the same tools and textiles that we can use to make things. And so um, Anne Robbins talked about um, this and she said, uh, my way of thinking about it is that I'm curating it with a modern viewpoint. So I am looking at the construction and the way costumes are put together and using textiles that would only have existed at the time, but some of the textiles are modern. So that's not, I, it can't be 100%, but it's about always striving for it to feel as authentic as I can, which I thought is really great. And I think that's something we've kind of talked about a little bit on here before, like you're not always going to be able to exactly replicate history, but it is good to see when you try. And I found a number of other interviews that she had done where she talked about, 
um, going through historical photographs, historical magazines, trying to make sure that these things look like what would have been sourced at the time. So I think she really has done her due diligence, uh, perhaps more than some of the more recent, you know, historical films um, have, you know, endeavored to do. I also was uh, thrilled to see that in the same interview um, and another interview as well, but she added a few more names um, to the Collider interview, but she talked about some of the inspirations that she had for Myrna, it, which included Clara Bow, which I was like, mm. Nicole's going to be happy about that one. I love that. <laughs> yes. I instantly started singing Bonnie and Clyde. It's fine. <laughs> yes, as you should. <laughs> it's never not on my mind whenever she comes up in conversation. Same. And it's weird Same. that she comes up quite often. Uh, I guess, yep. it's, you know, the career that we have chosen for ourselves. <laughs> um, but some of the other Hollywood ladies that uh, inspired her look included uh, Louise Brooks, Greta Garbo, Gloria Swanson, and Lillian Gish, um, which I thought was great. She also referenced uh, Marlene uh, Dietrich, 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 that's right. Yes, Marlene Dietrich and Myrna Loy. And I was so thrilled when I saw her mention Myrna Loy because I was like, I was not wrong. My random, my random knowledge was not inaccurate. Uh, so that made me quite happy uh, to see that. But yeah, I was just, I was thrilled uh, with the costumes. I thought they worked so well. And I thought a lot of them also worked towards the characters' evolutions in this film and where they've been and where they're going. Um, and I also randomly liked that for the scene where they let the staff be in the film, uh, that Thomas was wearing his little glove to hide his hand and that for some reason just i'm a hands person i'm always looking at people's hands i want to see what their rings look like i want to see what they're wearing and that just was a nice touch um because i sometimes feel like um we've wavered a little bit from that arc in the series for him um and i like that that is still still a reminder it's still there and yeah that was like a nice touching point for me yeah, I really love that. I um, I feel like this film actually overall did a really good job of sort of calling back to things earlier in the series. I thought the way that they handled both Matthew and Sybil within this film mm -hmm. was really beautiful and touching and, and a really nice tribute to sort of what came before and the characters that audiences really love. So, And better than the yeah. first film in a lot of Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. So much. I think that this movie overall is just a lot better than the first one. Mm -hmm. um, the first one was fun, but this actually is like a really good movie. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us in our 42nd episode of Petticoats and Poppies. We'd love to hear from you on social media and to hear what you think of Downton Abbey, A New Era. You can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Maggie over at Maggie of the Town, and you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16. You can listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and on the Eric Blue Media website, and of course, Audible. If you like what you hear, don't forget to leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on Podchaser. Every few episodes, we'll try to read our reviews and hear what you have to say about the show. We'll be back soon with another episode as we continue to look at period films from a history and film perspective. I can't wait. We're going to talk about one of my favorite movies of the year and one I of my least wait. favorite. Woo! It's going to be a blast. <laughs> <laughs>